and welcome back to the podcast. We are here with Chris Donald from inboxarmy.com. Now, Chris is an expert in the field of email marketing and automation, and he is all about using data-driven strategies to turn around underperforming accounts. So we're going to find out about what that is, how that can help you in your business, and what email marketing is all about. So, Chris, fantastic meeting you. Robert, thanks for having me. First of all, I appreciate it. I appreciate you too. And whenever I talk about email marketing, I feel like I'm talking to a long lost friend and I have to really hold back thinking about storytelling and subject lines and click through rates and things like that. So if someone comes to you and you tell them they're, you're all about email marketing, what is the elevator pitch? What do you have to say for yourself? Um, <clears throat> you know, we, you know, you said expert in the, in the thing and people use that word all the time. I'm not a fan, right? Because real email experts are really good testers, right? Um, so when we talk to people and people say, well, what would you do? A lot of times they'll say, I don't know. And they, they get concerned. I said, well, no, it's not a problem. It's just that we haven't audited your program and we haven't uh, looked at what you need. But it really comes down to testing. Everybody's audience is different. Everybody's goals are different. I mean, yeah, if you're e-commerce, you want sales, but there's actually more to that. Uh, if you're a charity, you want donations. If you uh, maybe you're more informational, educational in your approach, uh, it just really depends, right? So we, I generally say, we need to learn what your goals are, and then generally we audit to find out where they're at. Excellent. And so you you have these goals, and then you test and you work to move the needle to change the number. And as you and I know, when you add testing to it, it brings in all, all these counterintuitive results, right? Because back in the good old days, people had like email newsletters and they said, oh, only email on Fridays at 9 a.m. once a month. But then when you test, you get all sorts of uh, results that you would never have thought of in the first place, but then you actually are on the path somewhere to build that list, to increase that click-through rate, to get more sales, uh, et cetera, you know, get more clicks on the website and all those other things. And so what is the, the starting point in our conversation here? Like when, when it comes to email marketing and you do these audits, where are people stuck? What's the big problem? What's the low-hanging fruit? Most, most of the time, it tends to be automations, right? Because people tend to treat automations, I, I always say it's, like they treat it like a Ronco rotisserie. They set it and forget it, right? Um, and, and automations are generally your highest performing uh, engagement, right? So it's it, for e-commerce, it's generally the highest performing uh, revenue per email. And they tend to not pay attention to it, right? They, they set it up and they just, okay, it's working. One of the problem, big problems with email marketing is you can do it just okay or even badly and make money. And, and that is a problem, right? Because, oh, look, we're making money. But the question is, how much are you leaving on the table, right? So to give you an example, we had a, a client who was selling electric bikes. And they had a pretty standard three-message card abandonment program. And so when we went in, we went, okay, your average order value is 3,500, 4,500, 5,500. So that's not a decision you make quickly, right? You don't just go, oh yeah, let's buy an electric bike. No, you gotta see, I have enough on the credit card. Do I have to talk to my husband, my wife, whatever? Um, do I need to go look at other options? And so what we found was their average revenue for a year from card abandonment was $120,000. Now, nothing to sneeze at, but when we changed it from a three message that was basically over in three days to an eight message that was over in two weeks, in the first year, it made over a half a million dollars. So that's just, that's a simple example of why you need to look and you really need to understand what's happening in the buying cycle, what, how long people take, or, or you may have different uh, options. So if they have a, a small checkout value, they only get three messages. If it's a bigger amount, you elongate it. 
amazing by making those small changes and, and getting those bigger results. And what you just said there, that I've only really uh, clicked with me the, the past few years is that whole idea that automation does not mean set it and forget it, right? Automation means that you might actually go back and, and see how the gears are turning and say, you know, maybe I'll delete that or add that, or I've let that run for a long enough period of time that I didn't want to change it. But uh, for some reason in my head, whenever this whole term automation started going out there, I got in my head that like, oh, well, cool, that means hands-free. That means I don't have to change it. But but really automation means it's automation for that customer, that a lot of moving parts happen without you having to do it. But that doesn't mean that you don't have to measure and track and go back and refine. And so um, so just right there, that whole idea that many people sometimes just have like a few messages and it's over in a few days and there's people that are on that prospect list that they, they had an interest, they signed up, and maybe they're off doing the research and then they've forgotten about you and your company and now they need to be woken up more. And so are there any sort of like, ahas or insights such as these, such as, you know, add to the sequence or things like that. Like what kind of uh, surprises have you come across when it comes to changing up these sequences? So uh, I'll give you like one of the little secrets, right? So this is always good. People appreciate this. Uh, if you happen to be e-commerce or, or your, your thing is making money, right? In other words, it's whether it's you're selling something, a service, products, whatever it is. And you have automations like a card abandonment or a browse abandonment, even a welcome message uh, where you offer a discount or something like that. What I tell people is one of the simple things to do is to look at the last message in the automation. And if that's making money, add another message. Because adding another message doesn't cost a lot of money, but over the year, that message is going to make more money. Right? So if you have a three message card abandonment program and the last message is still making good money, add another message a couple of days later, it'll make more money. And, and I'll bring up another thing you said, you know, there were, when you said newsletters, you know, you send them out Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday and that type of thing. Well, that's another thing that we learned probably about seven, eight years ago when we were testing. B2B emails have always been Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, for the most part. You don't send on Monday because Monday the first day back, everybody's busy. You don't send Friday because they're halfway out the door. So you send Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. What we found with B2B emails was if you sent on Saturday, while open rates might drop a point or two, click through went up. And sometimes significantly because... Business, I mean, everybody checks their work email on Saturday. Most business owners certainly do. I bet you do. I do. Um, and what we found is they had more time to look and click and read something that they didn't have during the week. So that's just one of those things that without testing, you, you know, we have these things, best practices. You hear that word all the time, right? The problem with best practices are best practices aren't best for everyone. So you can't assume that, you know, Monday or Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are the days to send. Test, your audience may be different. I like that a lot, where like that, that whole Pez practices idea, it's really easy for it to fall into superstition, where you just kind of, you learn this thing and you pass it along, you don't actually practice. But what you're saying, uh, you know, put implement the practice part of best practices. You read up on these things about days to, to uh, test and send and use that as motivation to go out and send that blast and then see for yourself what the results are for you. Don't just say, oh, no, it's it's Monday. I can't do anything today. Like use the best practices as that sort of motivation to spring into action. And also speaking of motivation, you're saying to kind of sometimes build your funnel as you go. So that way you're not just saying, oh, I have to write these 15 emails. You're saying, you know, put a few messages in there and then see what the results are. And then look at that last message in the sequence and then say, well, is this making money? Well, great, I'll add something new to it. If not, then I'll change what uh, it is there that I'm uh, sending out. And so uh, next in our uh, kind of pre-list of questions that you sent me, you, you have in there, is buying an email list a good idea? And like, this is again, one of those common questions, right? When you, you talk about email marketing and building a list, and uh, at least me personally, my thinking goes into like, okay, building a list, I need to like 
get traffic on my site, get an opt-in form. But then many companies say, I just want the shortcut. I just want to go and uh, buy a list. So what are your thoughts on buying an email list? Is it a good idea? What should people do? It is super rarely a good idea, right? So our general answer to it is no, right? Because, you know, back in the day, I sent my first email marketing campaign in 1995, back when the internet was slow and ugly, right? So back then you could buy lists and print money. Even in the early 2000s, you could. The problem now is people's, people have gotten very protective of their inbox, right? It's not like... You know, you send junk mail to somebody, regular snail mail, and they get it. And they get maybe annoyed, but they don't scream and holler or do anything. They just throw it away. But when they get it in their email box, now the, you know, the ISPs, the Gmails, Hotmails, make it easy to market a spam, right? When you buy a list, first of all, is the list any good? Are you going to hygiene it? And that doesn't always help. So you can get you can have real damage to your domain, your rep sending reputation. It can cause your emails to go to the spam folder at a high rate. It can even get as bad as you can't send one-to-one -one emails anymore. That they just all your email goes into spam. So, and people say, well, you can use different domains and, and, and different IPs and do all this stuff. Well, that's what spammers do. So now you look even more like a spammer. Um, but, the other problem is the algorithms that like Gmail and these guys have, they pick this stuff up because the links in the in the copy is still the same. Doesn't matter what domain you use, or they still go to the same place. And those algorithms pick it up within a few days. So you can't trick the system. You really can't. Not in the long term anyway. Uh, but the chance for it going sideways and being really bad is is just far too high to take the chance and i don't want to be the person that has to go to the ceo and says we can't send email anymore. i mean that's not a conversation you want to have and i wonder after a while is it diminishing returns when you're do doing all this work with the multiple emails and email senders and you know trying to trying to fake your way to it at a certain point you're doing all this extra work for a, a small result versus doing it the proper way. And you know, as soon as the like the URL blacklist came out, I was thinking to myself, the whole buying a list idea is all over because that, for a while there, you yeah. can say, oh, well, same URL, but I'll just send from different centers. But as soon as it's like, you can send from any center in the world, but the, the landing page, that the domain name, the DNS where you land on, that's banned and doesn't matter where you send from. I thought, man, they finally caught no. up smart enough so what is the the solution what's the alternative to buying a list it's about driving traffic having a good uh you know whether it's a pop-up or a good uh good uh lead magnet you know for companies sometimes it's white papers or studies or whatever it might be for e-commerce it's a good discount hey sign up and get 20 percent off your first purchase or whatever it may be but it's really about driving traffic right Email is a nurturing channel, not an acquisition channel. That's the best way to think about it, right? Acquisition has to be done. And a lot of people will say, oh, I don't like pop-ups. You know, pop -up, people don't like them. Here's the deal. So what people say and what they do are always two different things. And pop-ups generate 10 times more subscribes than a static form at the bottom of the page. They just do. Sometimes a lot more than 10 times. And when, I think what is my goal? Is my goal to grow the business? Is my goal, to, is my goal to make money? Or is it to satisfy that small percentage that say they don't like pop-ups, that say they don't respond, but then you know that they, they do respond to that. And so you're saying that we need to be looking into uh, basically the traffic we already have on our website and be looking to have that free gift, be looking to build a list, be looking to have that pop-up, be looking to measure that and then increase the traffic to our website as well. So that way we're kind of just improving the whole system, right? We're funneling people from the website into the email list and we're tracking that. And we're also getting more people to go to our, uh, to our website in the first place because you say that it's a nurturing process. And I, I can almost guarantee that I have all sorts of like email marketing amnesia. 
Like I'm pretty sure that I buy something on Amazon because I see it for like the 18th time in an email sequence, but I become <laughs> so strained. Uh, like, you know, we, you and I, th- like we think about the the emails that we don't like, that we don't open, that we market spam, but there's probably like 20 to 50 senders that I just kind of am used to seeing. I'm trained to seeing these emails in my inbox and Amazon's probably the, the number one in the last few years. But there's also, you know, like, like thought leaders and marketers where just I'm used to seeing them in my inbox and I probably wouldn't notice it unless weeks or months pass without an email from those people. But I'm used to seeing it. I'm used to opening. I'm used to clicking. And I, I don't buy until all these months of, of the nurturing. And then it gets to the point where I don't even think about it. And so, you know, you see these people that are so eager to throw out what works, right? They say, oh, let me get to SMS texting and messenger bots and social media. And what do you say to those people? So those people who say, oh, well, I'm not interested in email marketing. I want the the new shiny stuff. Uh, Why is email marketing the sort of superior marketing solution? Well, I mean, most companies should have a multi-channel approach, but, you know, email generally has the highest ROI for dollars spent of any channel. Almost always does. Anywhere from 35 to Forty-two dollars per dollar spent. It, it's rare to find anything else. Now, we we have worked with companies in the past that do email, but social drives a lot of their revenue more than email. But they were born on social. They were socially driven from the beginning, right? So, it depends on the company certainly, but email has to be part of almost any type of company's communication. Right. And it and it should be a multi-channel approach. You know, there are people who say, well, SMS is the only thing. SMS has the highest opener. Well, of course it does, because people see an SMS come in and they want to clear the friggin' little icon so they can see when a new message comes in, and, but they don't necessarily click. And SMS works much better with under 40 than over 40. Right. Because the older you get, the small form factor of the phone just gets you know the eyes go the you know it's it's harder i wear glasses right i actually bought one of the one of the, the z fold you can't see it because of this but it's a z fold it opens right it's a galaxy z fold it's bigger so i can actually see things easier right um so if you have an older audience sms may not be you test it certainly right but it just may not be um uh, uh, the be all end all for your audience just because they just they don't act they work a lot on the on the small form factor right so you're saying multi-channel and even you mentioned a little while ago about sending a postal mail and you're making me think that whenever i sent just postal mail when i did a campaign just in a vacuum it didn't work nearly as well as when it was connected to all these different things and you're so right that it's easy to look at just the percentage of one little part of it to say well, SMS, I get this percentage, but if I get an SMS, and I don't know who the heck it is. I don't know what they're linking me to. I, I mark that as spam on my phone, right? I I, <laughs> I, I stop and then my Sometimes, carrier yeah. blocks the whole thing. But if it's part of, if I know I've opted into it, if it's someone I know them from social media, from email, I've been to their website, and then I get a text, that is more of welcome communication to me because I actually know who the heck it is and, and it's not spam. And so uh, as we're kind of winding down our conversation here, you've worked with all these exciting companies, you made all these cool changes. Uh, what types of email is most profitable for a company? If someone says, okay, now uh, Chris has got me so excited. I want to go and look at my, my funnel, my sequence. Uh, I want to go and send an, an email this week. What's a good email type to be sending? Um, well, you're certainly your automations, right? Your automations make more generally more revenue per message than anything else. So make sure you have your automation set up properly tested, all of that. Um, and for your manual campaigns, it's a testing thing. Know your audience. Um, what I tell people is when you send manual campaigns, you have to not only look at opens and clicks, but the heat maps, what did they click on? Right. So and give them more of what they click on. It's not hard. Give them what they want. It's pretty simple, in in fact. Right. But your automations, make sure they're dialed in. Take the time. You should be monitoring them on a regular basis, but reviewing them at least monthly. We review our client stuff weekly 
Because the thing about automations is they're triggered by an action, an inaction, a form, whatever, right? A purchase, a non-purchase, put something in your cart, which means there's an integration involved. Either a form is being submitted or purchase or, or something is happening, right? Which means those can break, those integrations. They can stop for all kinds of reasons. You know, the, the, the store software got upgraded or the software or the API programming got upgraded, whatever. And if you don't check it regularly, you, you, one of your automations could be just stop and you might not even know for months. And that could be some significant loss revenue. I agree completely. We need to be uh, checking those things, uh, reviewing weekly if possible. And it seems like the the mantra for our conversation today is give people more of what they want, right? They, they might say they want this, or you might guess something, or you might not even be taking enough action yet with your email marketing. So it's time to take action and put some of these pieces in place and begin measuring and look at those percentages, look at those conversion rates, click-through rates, see where you want to get them from this to that, get them from the website to the cart, from the cart abandonment to opening the emails, whatever that metric is, and just be improving that and giving people more of what they want so that you were turning them more into from prospects into buyers. But as you know, Chris, there's never enough time in the day, right? And, and there's always so many things to do. And imagine if we try to do everything ourselves, if we try to change our car's oil, try to unclog our own toilet, try to mow our own grass, we'd run out of time. But then so many business owners, yeah. they're treating their business this way, right? They think like, oh yeah, I'll get to my email marketing. And next thing you know, they haven't touched it in six months. The form, the API is broken. They haven't sent an email blast in, in two years. And it's just yeah. non-existent. So they, they need help. They need a team. They need something consistent. And so how does Inbox Army fit into that? What's the offer and why should someone jump on this? Well, Inbox Army does one thing, right? Well, two, really. We do email. We do SMS as well. Um, but that's all we do, right? So we basically do one thing and we do better, better than most. And we do it at, at a fair price as well. Um, we work with startups and small companies all the way up to big brands, right? Um, but we can help with anything. Just sometimes it's just auditing and let you know what you can improve, right? Um, even big companies will come to us for audits because when you work on your own program all the time, even if you're sending emails regularly and you've got automation set up, when you look at something over and over again, you don't see certain things. You tend to focus the same things all the time. It's just how our brains work. It's nobody's fault, right? Even in our own company, we switch out people looking at data and strategy all the time because it, you get stale. You can't help it. It's I, I always say it's one of these things because it's your subconscious that kind of runs things a little bit. So I use the example of, uh, have a wife ever said to you, I don't know if you're married or girlfriend, but have your wife ever said to you, hey, you notice anything different? And that's like, oh my God. No, no, don't ask me that question, right? And guys never do, right? We just don't notice it. But here's the deal. If we asked women the same question, they wouldn't know either. Because we see each other all the time. We don't actually look at each other, right? Because our subconscious goes, I know who it is. I don't have to pay attention there. I've got other things in my view that pay attention to. That's why we don't notice the change. Right. It's not that we don't love them. It's not that we don't pay attention. It's our subconscious ignoring certain things as we go. And it's the same thing when you look at your email program. You're going to look at the same things all the time. Your brain just isn't set up to look at that. Um, and the other thing I tell people is you run a business, you sell widgets or you do this and you're really good at that. You're not supposed to be good at email marketing. It's not your job. Right. It's better to, you know, it's kind of like, hey, I need brain surgery. Let me give it a shot. Just, you know, of course not, right? And it's not email marketing, it's brain surgery. But it's a lot harder than, than people think, right? You're so right that there's those blind spots from the repetition of being in our own business. It's like if you're gone on vacation for a week or two and you come back to your house and you think, oh, my house has a smell. I didn't realize it because I'm always living in it. Or like <laughs> somehow just when you're away for a while and then you come back to your own surroundings, it, it just, it looks new and you're like, whoa, this is like 
the first impression someone gets when they come into my house and and see and hear and, and smell things. And um, yep. the, the same is true of your business, right? Is that we can't like we we literally can't even see or imagine or understand what someone sees about our website or our emails or our checkout pages for the first time because we've just we live in it. We see it so much. And so we can, I can definitely see the value in having an email marketing ex expert, to use that word again, expert team, uh, such as Inbox Army, to go ahead and do that audit and see what needs to be done. And so uh, what does someone need to know about that going in? Like, is there like a, like a price range or is there like expectations or things that you wish a, a buyer of these services would know ahead of time? Uh, no, not really. They reach out. We do a free 30 minute consultation with people. Right. And I guarantee whether you work with us or not, you'll come out of that call with, with some good information. Right. Um, you know, our prices can be as, as low as, uh, you know, maybe a thousand dollars and can go up from there. Right. So, and again, we try to help, especially small mid-sized businesses. Right. We're pretty reasonable when it comes to that. If you have a budget that you have available, we'll tell you if we can work with it. Um, but the first thing is just to, to give a call, set up a call, doesn't cost anything, 30 minutes of your time. I guarantee that we'll be able to answer some of your questions, whether you work with us or not. Very nice, very generous. So if someone wants to claim that 30 minute call and find out about Inbox Army, what's the next step? What's the call to action? They just go to the website and you can click and schedule your own call. You can choose the day and time, schedule a call. We'll send you a confirmation. It comes automatically and, and you'll be ready to go. It's that simple. Fantastic. Inboxarmy.com is the place to go right now and schedule that call because guaranteed you're leaving money on the table in some way when it comes to your email marketing. And it might be awkward. It might be scary. You might have the regrets of saying, ah, oh, I would have, should have, could have set up this automation, the sequence. Well, guess what? Uh, the past is done, but the time is now to get that email marketing dialed in. So that way you can enjoy what Chris and his team grow for you in the future. So inboxarmy.com is the place to go. And so Chris, just to make sure that we wrap up this conversation with a bang instead of a whimper, do you have any uh, lasting words of advice? Do you have a favorite lesson or quote or advice you wish you'd gotten 20 years ago? What comes to mind? Yeah, so the biggest thing is if you're doing newsletters, so in the old days, you, newsletters had all kinds of content right? You still see them today. And while some do well with that, too many try to put, you know, it's like 10 pounds of crap in a five pound bag, right? So less is actually more. If you look at a heat map or where people are actually clicking in a long newsletter, you're going to find that about 80% of it is in that first screen almost. So, and people spend so much time creating that content and doing this. And it's just, the value of past that has very little. And people just don't have as much time either. And unfortunately, we've kind of become a country of non-readers, right? Unfortunately, that's really the case. Give them one or two things to focus on. Make sure it has value for them. It's important that emails have value. So from email to email, they, uh, they keep coming back to keep opening your emails. So don't worry about creating a ton of content create one or two pieces of really valuable content for your audience. I love it. Value does not mean length. And you know, Chris, I, I read something the other day that something like 46% of adults have not read a book in the past year. And I completely believe it. And so knowing that short attention span, we need to be thinking and acting differently to get with the times. And the very next step to get with the times is go to inboxarmy.com. We will see you there. And thank you very much, Chris, for a, a fun, enlightening, and actionable conversation. I appreciate it. My pleasure, Robert, and thanks again for having me.